Welcome to the J-Boy Show, hosted by Jake Crane, the fastest growing sports show in the nation. I'm Coach Hugh Freeze. This is Super Bowl champion Brandon Graham. Hey, this is DJ Shockley, and you're watching. And you're watching. Well, thanks for watching the J-Boy Show. Hello, everybody. Thanks for hopping in on another edition of the J-Boy Show. Going to get to Chris Doring and our interview with him. Great stuff. It's always great. Uh, SEC Network, Sirius XM, guy that played at Florida, was an unbelievable player, unbelievable wide receiver, set records, one that just got overpassed uh, this last season there at Florida. Uh, but something we talk about and, and something that I think you guys you know find interesting, there's different opinions on it, is these neutral site games uh, early in the season, You know whether it's uh, Georgia and Clemson playing in Charlotte or uh, Alabama, Miami playing in Atlanta. I, I don't like that. I, I, something that is great about college football, one of the main great things about college football is that home team, hometown, on-campus stadium, close-to-campus stadium atmosphere, that community atmosphere uh, that makes those games so electric. Not that, you know, the fans aren't loud in, in the Dome in Atlanta and our New Orleans when they meet up, but to me, neutral sites are reserved for bowl games. Not for, for big matchups early in the season. Then you look at teams, teams like Auburn going to Penn State and Penn State coming to Auburn. Uh, and then LSU going to UCLA and UCLA going to LSU and Alabama going to Oklahoma State and Oklahoma State coming to Alabama. To me, uh, th- they make for much better stories, but much better experiences. Uh, it's just something, it just doesn't feel as, as electric as it normally does or uh, that being able to wake up and walk outside of, of the town you grew up in and hear the band playing and, and knowing that there's a team that you've never seen in person, maybe from the other side of the country, that's coming into your backyard to play against your team. Uh, to me, that that means something. And and I get it, the, the revenue for these cities and the TV and all this other stuff, but it's just not the same. I, I wish we'd get back, and, and as me and Chris Doring talk about, it's somewhat trending back to the way uh, that I prefer it to be, where you're going and playing home and homes. Uh, you think about the difference in, in you know, Legion Field uh, when they used to play the Iron Bowl there and now playing it at Auburn and Alabama. You look at Georgia, Florida, and I know I'll catch back for this. I don't like they play in Jacksonville. Why aren't we playing in Athens and Gainesville? Well, why do we do this? I, I, I don't get it. You should have to earn the right to play at a neutral site and that be a bowl game or the playoff. This, the regular season is meant for regular venues, and the regular venues are the hometown venues of those teams. I hope we keep pushing back to that. I hope we get back to that because that makes it fun and it's a better experience. I think not only for the home team and the hometown fans, uh, but the away team and the away fans. And I'll use Auburn as an example. Going up to Happy Valley, there's probably people, uh, Auburn fans, that would never go to Pennsylvania other than the other than the reason to watch Auburn play Penn State and be, being able to go in that stadium and see it, whether it's a whiteout or not. You'll have those stories forever. A lot of people have been to the Georgia Dome. A lot of people have been down in New Orleans to the Dome. But that's just, it's different. It's a different feel. And you get to know the tailgating. What separates that school? What stories you're able to take back that say, hey, they did it different here. You should have tried this restaurant there or this, that, and the other. To me, the neutral site games just feel corporate. I, I don't know another way to put it. They just feel corporate. And as college football becomes more corporate, which I hate, regardless of how you feel, that's the way it's becoming. There's some things that I think we can use to kind of set it up as guardrails or roadblocks uh, before it becomes too corporate. And I really hope we keep trending back to that. Kudos to the teams that are going uh, to play home and homes against these other teams. It's going to make for great stuff. Not that Georgia Clemson is not going to be a great game. Or Alabama Miami, you know, uh, at least until after the first quarter is probably not going to be a great, or probably going to be a great game. Uh, but I want to get back to the hometown feel. And I think a lot of you guys will agree with me. But hey, make sure you stay tuned. We got Chris Doring. We're talking everything. We're talking the new playoff. We're talking West. Is there a surprise team? Auburn, Ole Miss, Arkansas. Uh, what does he think about Alabama? We talk about Georgia. And if you saw the graphic we put out, we're going to be doing this. We're ranking the SEC uh, positions by group at wide receiver. Had a big debate between Georgia uh, and Alabama there, who has the number one group. I have it at Georgia. See what Chris Doring thinks. Hang on, and let's win the water cooler. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us again on an interview portion of another edition of the J-Boy Show. Really excited to get to one of my favorite guests, a uh, guy that's been with us kind of from the beginning, took a chance on us, uh, and he's glowing up as usual, especially as we get close 
uh, to SEC football season. But first, I do got to give a shout out to our partners at betonline.ag. Head over there today. We got the NBA playoffs. Uh, took the under yesterday on the Sixers Hawks. Hit it barely by the by the hair on my chinny chin chin, but they had it there. They got great sign up bonuses. The online casino is always open. We got Major League Baseball as well. Uh, props, parlays, teasers, pleasers, however you get down. Head over to betonline.ag today and tell them that J Boy sent you. Uh, but excited to bring in SEC Network football analyst, Sirius XM host on the SEC channel, uh, and a good friend of mine and the show and former standout uh, at Florida with Danny Werfel, a guy we've had on as well, Chris Doring. Chris, what's up, buddy? Jake, man, good to be back on with you, man. Congratulations with all the success. And and uh, this guest list has gotten pretty deep. Like you said, I was I was one of the first. But, yeah. uh, man, you, you've taken it to new heights with all these folks you've had on, man. So congratulations. Well, okay, Chris, I appreciate that, man. And you know I, you always have a special place. And every time we can get you on here, uh, especially not only uh, in season but off season, uh, it's an honor, man. And, and uh, the audience loves it. I always get great response when I have you on here. Uh, and I want to start with, you know, something that's come out. And listen, we, this is a horse that's going to get beat to death, uh, but we might as well take a swing while I, while I got you on here. Uh, this 12-team playoff. Uh, yesterday and, and throughout, you know, the past month, month and a half, uh, I've advocated for an 18-team playoff. Uh, went through kind of my uh, a theorem. You know, I'm not Pythagoras or anything, but I have a mm-hmm. theorem on, on my 18-team playoff and kind of how it would go down. What do you think about the expansion? And, and what do you think about 12, man? 12 is a lot. Like I say, man, if you can double your money at eight, I guess you could triple it at 12. Hell, why not? Well, I, I thought for sure that expansion was necessary. I mean, mm-hmm. there's been a lot of debate, obviously, over the last few years about teams that have been left out or teams that are included, um, conferences more so that have been left out. And I think that that's really the driving force behind this expansion. I'm like you. I, I thought it was going to expand to an 18 playoff. Uh, we've always heard about extending uh, the playoffs and the postseason too long is, is something that, that the NCAA was trying to avoid. Um, but I, I honestly think after listening to some of the reasoning about it, it makes a lot of sense. And the idea being that, you know, you're going to have representation from the power five champions. Uh, you're going to have, you know, one top group of five team and still have six at large teams that uh, will be able to be included there. Um, I'm actually kind of excited about it, you know, depending on, on um, you know how it and when it ends up playing out, it, it should be pretty fun, and it's obviously going to generate a lot more money uh, with a bigger television deal that is certainly in need right now. After all of these schools are coming off a hit they took during the pandemic. Yeah, and uh, you know we talk about increasing parity and, and different ways to do that uh, with the twelve teams. Uh, you, you get exposure, which helps with recruiting. It's going to be interesting to follow this and, and kind of how. They put guardrails on it. You know, do you get automatic bids from Power Five conferences if you win the conference championship? How many at larges? Whatever, whatever, whatever. I'm sure they'll go back and forth. Like you, I'm surprised it was at 12. Uh, but you know, kind of looking down the road and and prognosticating uh, what's going to happen. Do you think kind of part of our problem? And again, Alabama's earned success. Clemson's earned success. Ohio's uh, State has earned success. You think part of the problem is we get kind of stuck in these narratives early of these are the five or six teams that can make it. Uh, and, you know, kind of regardless what happens, that's the way it sticks. Do you think that kind of needs to change? And will this change that? Well, I mean, I think it's gotten better. Um, the fact that the the, um, the college football playoff rankings don't come out until a good portion of the season has been played, Agreed. I think has, has helped uh, in the old days. You're right. You know, wherever the preseason rankings were, it was very difficult for somebody to that may have been left out of the top 20 to, to make a, a climb high enough to be included. But I, I do like the way that that the committee you know takes into consideration a, a large portion of the season before they they put out their initial rankings. Um, you know, I think the thing, Jake, that I'm most excited about, though, is what this might do, not not in the postseason necessarily, which will be fun, but what it'll do to open up the regular season schedule and maybe take a little bit of the pressure off of the need to, to play these FCS games and to play more group of five games. I'm, I'm interested to see how much now with a little more margin for error, we continue to see some of these, these uh, power five teams scheduling other power five conference opponents. I, I just think it, it's, we're at the point now where a better product in the regular season needs to be uh, given to the fans. It, it, you can't charge a hundred plus dollars for tickets to watch, you know, Alabama play UT Chattanooga. You know, I know there's, there's a need for FCS teams, uh, to help their budgets with games like this. But I do think there's a way now to include some of the FCS teams in what you're doing in the spring, uh, be able to have a better regular season schedule that's more appealing to the fans, and have a great postseason tournament that uh, much more resembles what we're seeing right now in college baseball 
and in, in college basketball when we're, when we're going through March Madness. Yeah, and, and yeah, I agree 100%. You know, I hope we can kind of trim some of the fat off the schedule, especially if, you know, games are being added because more teams are being put in there. I think it helps with opt-outs. But to me, uh, you know, these these cupcake games, as you will, it, it's almost like back in the day, you know, as long as humans have been here, when they used to go in the Gladiator Arena, you didn't want to pay like eight apples and, and a goat to go watch a 6'9 <laughs> guy fight a five-foot guy, you know, with one arm. You, you want to pay that to go watch – you know, big gladiators fight big gladiators. And and I think you're exactly right. And, and listen, I know you can't sit here and have top five matchups every time. And, and that's that's a great segue, Chris, because, you know, I, I see these these matchups and, and you look at Georgia and Clemson. I love it. But mm-hmm. why do we got to play these at neutral sites? Why can't we play this these just home and homes old school? And I know it's cool. Like you travel, the fans travel here and this and the other. But one of the best parts about college football is that that game day atmosphere on campus or in that community, in that town. I wish yeah. we could have these games and just not play them at neutral sites. To me, it's just, I know it's about money in the bottom line, but what are your thoughts on that? Am I reaching? Well, I, I, I think we're starting to see more of those games being scheduled. Uh, I think the time of having these neutral site games has, has come and gone. Oh, uh, I know. You. Thank you. Believe uh, that we're trending more towards having these great home and home games that are going to, they're going to sell tickets. And let, let's be honest to me, ticket sales had been down everywhere in the sec for the most part maybe outside of Georgia uh, and Alabama. But I think a lot of it has to do with what, what the, the, the fans are being offered. I think the other thing you've got to do is you have to re-engage the students. Mm-hmm. Today's students are tomorrow's donors. And if you don't get them engaged when they're on campus uh, as students in your university, they're not going to be likely to want to come back. They're not going to be likely to want to give the money that they are, is required to, to keep up with this, this facilities race that's going on. Uh, so I honestly believe that putting a better schedule together with more appealing games is, is not only going to benefit, you know, the, the television contracts, but it's going to it's going to benefit the sales of the tickets and the attendance that ultimately shows up and the next generation of boosters that's going to help to keep these programs on track with what they're spending. Uh, without a doubt. And, and the people that are in the community that have restaurants and uh, own hotels and stuff like that, it's yeah. huge for obviously the economies there and coming off a of COVID year. They yeah. need that. I mean, you think about yeah. places like Auburn, Oxford, Tuscaloosa. I mean, these aren't major metropolitan cities. You know, that they need that. I mean, I think Auburn's uh, income, I, I looked at it, and, and again, my numbers may be a little bit off, but, you know, six days during the fall is when they make most of their money uh, yeah. from a community standpoint in that venue. Uh, so that's pretty interesting to follow as it, well. It, it is. It's a great point, too, because, you know, living here in Gainesville, I know a lot yeah. of business owners that are, are right around campus with bars and restaurants. They obviously lost a ton of money last year, but if you're going to roll out a schedule, you know, that has a bunch of, of group of five teams on there and, and, and FCS opponents, it's really not going to help. Even though you're playing games, the attendance is going to be down. You know, the hotel stays are not going to be what they would be. And that's why I love, you know, Florida's home schedule this year, third game of the season, Alabama comes to town. You got Tennessee coming to town. You got Florida state coming to town. It's a really good bounce back season for not only the, the businesses around campus, uh, but for the university selling season tickets, uh, I know there's a high demand. And one of the things I think that Dan Mullen's done a great job of is trying to reinvigorate and re-engage the fan base. And you, you saw it uh, two years ago, the Auburn game may have been one of the most electric atmospheres that the Swamp has seen in a long time. That's what it was on a week-in, week-out basis when I was there. So I think it's an important thing that, that Dan Mullen's doing. And uh, I think this schedule this year is going to do a, a nice job of getting everybody back into the swamp and creating that atmosphere. It's always been one of the more formidable ones in our conference. Uh, I agree. And, and I'm going to ask you about Florida and Dan Mullen kind of in the second half of this interview. I, the, the other day, I know he signed a contract extension. I'm, I'm kind of thinking a general direction uh, and, and want your opinion on it here in a second. But, uh, you know, before we get there, to kind of put a bow on, on you know, these non-conference games and stuff like that, uh, Chris, when we're having teams schedule, Alabama and Oklahoma State just scheduled a game for 2029. Will we be playing on holographic fields in 2029, or will it be like uh, in the clouds or something like this? Because where we're going, you look at these facilities, Georgia, each chair in there costs 12 grand and is made out of Lamborghini leather. I, I don't know who donated that, DJ Khaled, whoever donated that, whatever, whatever. But I'm just trying to imagine what these football facilities are going to look like in 2040. I mean, yeah. I don't know if they can be playing the games on Facebook. I mean, I don't know. How's it going to work? Well, you know, Jake, uh, when I was a kid, I, I'm a little older than you, you know, grew up in the, the late 70s and early 80s. 
you know, I was always sold a bill of goods about this flying car thing that we expected <laughs> to have happen in the beginning of the, the, the 2000s. And that yeah. still has not come to fruition. So I, I don't know. I, I do agree with you. The, the stadiums have, have definitely come a long way. I love how they, you know, have kind of made it more fan friendly. You're seeing a lot of stadiums actually retract some of their seating mm-hmm. or contract some of their seating and, and, uh, and, and making it more of a, 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 an opportunity for socialization to take place. Uh, I do hate the fact that uh, one of the, 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 the main features that everybody wants to have is, is great Wi-Fi in the stadium so that, that, that everybody can be on their phones and, and checking in with everybody else on social media. I mean, what happened to the days where the actual game and the players were the draw? Uh, I may be the old school get off my lawn guy, but uh, it, it is interesting <laughs> what has to be done in order to try yeah. to draw fans to a stadium these days yeah without a doubt i think you got a better chance of finding bigfoot than finding great wi-fi I, i've had phones and been in tons of buildings i still haven't found great wi-fi yet uh but now chris i think it's a great point speaking of a great point you need to head to the google app store anywhere you get your apps and download the dynasty U app right now it's totally free it's like linkedin for high school recruits whether your son daughter you're trying to get eyes on them instead of emailing the coach thirty thousand times and pissing them off and then having to get them sent it to a recruiting guy that's never going to look at it and kind of put it in a file uh, you know, next to the rest of the denied loans, you need to download this app. It's unbelievable. It's concise. The college coaches love it, it, love it as well. Your info is right there from grades to social media, whatever you want. And it's easy to navigate and it's easy to put together. That's the Dynasty U app. It's anywhere you get your apps and it's free right now. I keep telling you guys, get it while it's free. Get it while it's free because just like anything, uh, especially nowadays, it's not going to be free for long as popular as it is. That's Dynasty U uh, go download that today. Uh, we're here with Chris Doring, buddy of mine, buddy of the show, uh, talking a, a little bit of everything. And I'm going to get to Florida, Chris, and, and I'm going to ask you about the East. But uh, we've been putting out graphics. We started to rank the SEC position groups. And I know this one is near to dear in your heart, uh, the wide receiver. I mean, we all know that the catch uh, you made against South Carolina, we talked about last time with Danny Werfel. I believe it was South Carolina going up by the crossbar, something you guys have yep. worked on. Uh, and uh, there's a big debate between Georgia and Alabama. And, and listen, those two rosters – uh, Texas A&M, you know, is getting there. LSU, we, we know, is really talented. Florida has talent, whatever, whatever. But those two teams are on a different level. UGA adds Eric Gilbert. I'm going under the impression he's eligible. I've got UGA and then Bama in my wide receiver group. I know Bama has the Williams kid from Ohio State, and we know that they just have aliens running around that campus. Uh, but when you look at Georgia's wide receiver group in Alabama, would you put one in front of the other right now, or, or kind of what do you think? Yeah, it's funny you bring that up, Jay, because I actually saw your rankings on social media yesterday, and it started me thinking. I haven't really uh, dove into a lot of that yet at this point in the offseason, but in just kind of thinking about it after seeing what you posted, crazy how much difference a year makes. Because remember last year heading into the season, we really had no idea you know, what the wide receiving core for Georgia was going to look like outside of George Pickens. Uh, they had a number of young guys step up, and, and you're right, you know, Alabama – has a, a bunch of highly recruited guys. We, we know about uh, Slade Bolden from him stepping up. Obviously, John Mechie is going to be the number one guy, but there's a lot of highly recruited guys that we don't necessarily know a lot about yet at the college level or have seen a lot of production from. But on the other side, you know, I look at all the, the different guys that had a chance to contribute last year, and, and certainly they went through some growing pains, and they're obviously going to miss George Pickens in Athens this year. But I really believe that yeah, you're right. I think they're the number one group heading into the season. I'm not so sure, like you, have some skepticism about Eric Gilbert and his uh, uh, ability to even be eligible this year. Mm-hmm. And even if he does, like this idea that, hey, he's going to switch to playing wide receiver exclusively, I don't, I don't buy that. You know, I think he's, he's uh, too big of a, a matchup issue to, to strictly line up at one spot. I think you move him around a lot like Kyle Pitts did at, at Florida last year. You can get some of those matchups outside, but just to say that you're going to move to wide receiver <laughs> and, and be this great player uh, right off the bat. I've, I've heard a lot of people talk about him replacing George Pickens at the X position. I, I don't see that happening. Uh, I don't know that he has the same sort of speed to take the top off. And you definitely want a guy at that position that can, can de- demand some attention and, and have a safety role in that way a lot. Now I, I'm not so sure yet that he has enough of the, the full repertoire at the wide receiver spot yeah. to be that guy that a lot of people are projecting. No, I, I'm right there with you. And, you know, I look at him, and, and I want to preface, preface this by saying Eric Gilbert is a great athlete. He's a great athlete, going to have a chance playing the NFL if he takes care of the stuff off the field and, you know, keeps his nose down and grinds. He's a little stiff in the hips to me, Chris. Like, I, I don't know if he's a guy that can sit there and snap off to come back and, and be fine yeah. playing on the outside and having to do some of those things. Because, look, hey, we talk about it all the time. 
in this league with these type of players, you're not going to have guys running wide open all the time. But having a guy like Eric Gilbert, you put him on the inside, match up against a nickel, somebody like that can win the 50-50 ball or box somebody out and get the rebound in the red zone. Uh, I don't think he's going to be a guy they just line up outside at one and say, all right, man, here's the route tree. Here, yeah. Run a bunch of slants and hitches and, and do all this other stuff, uh, you know, corners and stuff like that. But he's going to add uh, a big piece of that. And, you know, Chris, what, what do you think about this SEC transfer rule? I talked about it yesterday in my solo show. And, and I'm a firm believer that this is going to be, and I will say it again, the McCarthyism and the red scare of the SEC because – the accusations of tampering, in my opinion, are going to be out of control. I mean, yeah. what happens if you have one coach go from one place in the SEC, then he goes to another place in the SEC, and in two weeks, two of the guys in his position group transfer there in a position of need that they had to have. And yeah. I'm wondering, Chris, if I'm hiring coaches, like, why would I not hire a coach from the SEC that coaches a position group that's a position of need for me? I feel like I'd have a good shot of getting the kids he helped recruit and sign. Yeah, it's a funny point. It, it, it reminds you a lot of, uh, you know, when, uh, who was it, Arkansas, I guess, signed uh, Gus Malzahn at, at a, at being a high school coach mm -hmm. because of the, the Springdale Five. Um, it, it will be an interesting dynamic. But I'm, I'm curious as how you went from Eric Gilbert talk to tampering talk. That, I, I don't know the mm, connection there. That's, that's really an interesting, interesting segue there. Huh? Yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's uh, definitely <laughs> one that a lot of people are talking about, and, and there's been a lot of accusations about. I think we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg at this point in time. I, it, it's a very crucial time in college athletics and specifically college football right now as we're talking about you know, the transfer rule. We're talking about name, image, and likeness that goes into act here in, in a number of SEC states within the next 30 days. Um, and I, I'm not sure how you, you manage all the things that are going on. Um, I, I know there's a lot of probably – unforeseen consequences that we're going to be dealing with in the next couple of years. And I, I certainly believe uh, tampering is one of those. Uh, I, I already think it ha has existed even before the, the, the one-time transfer rule has been passed. Uh, but I think it's, o it's only going to go to another level. Uh, you know this, Jake, and, and you've been around the game for a long time and coaching and everything else. Like coaches are going to push the limits, especially with as yep. much money as on the line these days. Uh, the risk to reward is, is, is in favor of, of doing things that are in the gray or maybe sometimes outside of the, the, the boundaries. So I, I think whatever you do, you've got to come up with strict punishment to really make an example out of somebody that chooses to, to break the rules just to try to keep things uh, between the lines and, and to try to keep things fair and equitable across not only the conference but in, in college football in general. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you 100%. You're there to push the limits, just like the old saying, a coach is there to push a player further than he can take himself. That doesn't just uh, talk about the player. That's in other areas as well because the, the money's ridiculous in yeah. this league. And, uh, you know, I, I do want to shift again. Uh, no uh, no subtle segue here, I guess. Uh, that was that was clean. You caught on to that. It's kind of funny. Uh, you think you did this for a living now. But um, looking at the West, Chris, to me, and listen, the East – you know, it looks like Georgia is, is head and shoulders above everybody. They got to play the games. We, we know that. And there's talent and stuff like that. But looking at the West, Alabama reloads. They don't rebuild. But when you look in that second tier, and this is a question I've asked a lot of guys, you look at A&M, you look at LSU, uh, people are kind of putting them in their own group underneath there. You look at the schedule. Uh, who would you take, LSU or A&M finishing second in the West right now? Uh, not to put you on the spot, or maybe they tie and the tiebreaker goes to one of them. That's what I have, and it's LSU. But uh, do, you, do you have any feeling either way? I mean, you can dance around if you want. Just, you know, let me know how you're feeling. Yeah, it, it's, it's amazing how different those two teams come into the season. You know, mm -hmm. you, you look at uh, what LSU did coming off that national championship in 2019, one of the more disappointing seasons of all time for a defending national title winner. Uh, but, you know, some of the, the, the growing pains they went through last year certainly – should benefit them this year. I mean, you look at all the young guys that got an opportunity to play in the secondary. Uh, Durante Jones takes over on that side of the ball. So they can't be any worse defensively no. than they were last year. And, and offensively, you know, they're, they're blessed with a lot of skill players. And it'll be interesting to see how the quarterback battle takes shape. Um, so I, I do believe that LSU is going to be a lot better and benefit from those struggles last year. A&M is an interesting team to me though you know what made them so good last year and you know this jake as well as i do was the offensive line yeah. that offensive line was dominant in Bash. the run game it opened up the play action pass they uh, allowed kellen mon to be sacked very infrequently you lose four of the five starters and i know you know talking to everybody including my buddy cole kublik who and I, I i defer to him on uh, offensive line talk when it comes to this conference more than anybody um but there, there's still a lot of guys even though they're 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 
you know, highly recruited and talented players, they haven't played together, you know, and mm-hmm. I think the offensive line more than anything has to play as a unit together and have great chemistry and communication. Um, so I'm inter- interested to see how quickly they can get back to being that dominant team. A and M, you know, if you, it, it's very, it, it's a very simple formula for what's taken them, you know, from where they were when Jimbo Fisher took over to where they are now. And it's, it's what we say all the time. It's a line of scrimmage league. Their improvement on the offensive and defensive lines um, has translated to their success. I think they've become much more physical. Uh, El, uh, Mike Elko has, has been tremendous in, in what he's brought to the defensive side of the ball. Uh, but they are a much more physical team than they've ever been before Jimbo got there. Um, and, and so I do have some some um, curiosity about what that offensive line will look like this year. And, and let's not forget, I mean, Kellen Mond, I don't think he was given a lot of the credit that he deserved. And I was one of the last to probably come on board with, with the Kellen Mond train, but I thought he did a nice job last year of, of understanding the offense a little bit better through with greater accuracy. I go back to that Florida game. He was tremendous on third down. Florida was trying to blitz him. The offensive line picked it up really well. And when they wasn't picked up, you know, Kellen Mond knew he wasn't protected and got the ball out of his hands quickly with accuracy. Um, you know, there's a lot that I think you, you lose that we may not be accounting for at the quarterback position too. So I probably would lean towards maybe taking LSU slightly above, uh, uh, ahead of A&M, but I know that's probably not a, a popular choice. Um, you know, as much love as I've been hearing the Aggies getting so far this off season. Yeah. I, I get, like I said, I got LSU finishing second, uh, winning the tiebreaker over Texas A&M. They play in the last game of the year at home. Uh, we're here with Chris Doring catch him on. Sirius XM, the SEC channel, college football analyst for the SEC Network, a, a man of many things, uh, Pee Wee football coach as well. The dude can do it all. Uh, but Chris, you know, as, as we kind of wind down, uh, I do got to ask you, you know, staying in the West, looking at Auburn, you look at Ole Miss, you look at Arkansas, uh, teams, you know, trying to build it back a little bit. Uh, Sam Pittman entering his second year, Brian Harson entering his first, Lane Kiffin entering his second. Of those three teams, Auburn, Arkansas, and Ole Miss, do you think we get a surprise uh, a year at eight, nine wins out of one of those teams? Golly, it, it would be interesting. You know, I, I think Auburn is, is maybe the biggest enigma of anybody heading into this season. You know, of all the four new coaches, um, Brian Harson inherits probably the most talent of any of those, those uh, other coaches in this conference. Um, I thought, you know, he did a great job in terms of hiring coordinators with, with guys and, and Mike Bobo and Derek Mason that have been in this conference and, and understand this league. Um, so I thought that yeah, he may have assembled the best staff of any of the new four head coaches in this mm-hmm. conference. Um, but, you know, I look at Ole Miss as well. I kind of similar along the same lines of, of what, um, you know, we talked about with LSU, their defense can't possibly be any worse no. than it was last year. So if you just get a mild improvement on that side of the ball, I think Matt Corral's, you know, among the cream of the crop in, in, in the entire country, let alone the, the conference, uh, two really talented running backs. I, I think, you know, the creativity of the offense uh, and what, what Lane Kiffin's doing there, it's become must-see TV to me. And so I, I'm, I'm kind of excited about what they might be able to do. I don't have their schedule in front of me right now, but I, I do I, – I think um, I think Ole Miss has a chance to, to take a, a big step forward this year in year number two of Lane Kiffin's tenure there in Oxford. Yeah, and I love the connection of Matt Corral and Braylon Sanders. I, I think Braylon Sanders is one of the most underrated wide receivers coming into this year. Because, I mean, again, you know, you look at the numbers and they're not just eye-popping. But at least going into the season, Matt Corral seems very comfortable. You look at spring, uh, what he did in the spring game. Kenny Yaboa comes back as well. You talk about their defense. I'm surprised one of those paranormal activity shows didn't show up in the uh, Ole Miss field house and go in the defensive room and looking for ghosts because that's all that was on the field, bringing in oh, one wow. of those little, like, radioactive detectors or whatever in there. They could have found some. But – uh, Chris, hey, my- isn't, it, isn't it curious real quick? I'm going to throw a question to you. Jake. Hey, like, hit me, I, Chris. I, hit me. I, I'm not – there was a lot of improvement with uh, Mike McCarthy's defense there. Like, um, I, I, don't, uh, I don't – that's his name, right? I'm going to go and blank on it. You're talking about uh, – about, uh, right? you're talking about DJ Durkin? No, yeah, before that, though. Like, oh, he, yeah, he yeah. Was, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, McCarthy yeah, yeah. Was the, uh, was the defensive coordinator under the, the last uh, coach That's there. exactly right. You're right. You're right. You're right. I, they actually had some improvement. I'm not sure why they didn't end up deciding to retain him. I, that was uh, a little curious to me. Yeah, you know, when I look at a situation like that, uh, and again, you know, what goes on in the inner workings, this, that, and the other, because they were improving. And, I mean, you look at the defense this year, you watch the spring game, some of those names that were starters on last year's defense, it's funny how they're now second stringers and, and third stringers on this year's defense. And you look at the junior college situation in the state of Mississippi, 
Mississippi uh, and, and LSU, or excuse me, Ole Miss has really leaned into that. They had to. I mean, Chris, I throw this stat out all the time, but still, every time I say it, it blows my mind. Last year against Alabama, if Ole Miss didn't put a defense out on the field, they would have only given up 20 more yards. That is insane, Chris. I mean, that's yeah. really insane to think about. I've never heard a statistic like that before. That really was uh, uh, one of the more popular things that, that hit social media last year as it regarded to, to college football. Um, but you're, you're, you're right. I, mean, I, I think let, let's look at it as a positive, though. Like that recruiting pitch to some of the top junior college players or yeah. freshmen coming out or high school seniors coming out, like, dude, did you watch our defense last year? Did you see how terrible we are? You can come in and start right away. And so I do think it actually could be something they could use as a positive to help uh, maybe make some significant strides in upgrading talent. The biggest thing I want to see guys tackling and guys being aligned properly. And I know that was something that everybody kind of suffered from defensively last year because of the pandemic and not having the normal offseason time together. But just get aligned, know your assignment, and tackle with a little bit more consistency. And I think that that Ole Miss team – in general, will be much better next season. All they need is a couple stops a game with that offense and, and Lane Kiffin yeah. and Jeff Levy calling the plays. Uh, but last question before I let you go, I can't get you out of here without talking a little bit more about Florida. Uh, and, it, you know, you look at Emory Jones. He kind of fits more of what Dan Mullen has had in the past. You look at Florida's offense last year with what they are able to do with Trask and Pitts and Kadarius, Tony, and all them. And they, were, they really kind of spread it out a lot more than Dan had done in the past, especially in the red zone. And when you got weapons like that, why not? Uh, utilize the running back out of the backfield, whether it's more wheel routes. I mean, it could have been sponsored by Goodyear. They ran so many wheel routes last year, and they hit in big games. I mean, that's a matchup back against linebacker. If you can catch somebody with their pants down, you catch them with their pants down. But do you think this offense will kind of go back to heavier personnel, a little more dose of the run game, a little more play action, or, or do you think they're going to keep it a little bit uh, open as they did last year? Because they put a lot on Kyle Trask. I don't think a lot of people realize how much they put on Kyle Trask, yeah. which is a compliment to him. First and foremost, I want to give credit to Dan Mullen and his staff. I think they do the best job of anybody in this conference when it comes to finding advantages, finding matchups, creating opportunities for, for, for favorable situations for their players offensively, uh, minimizing deficiencies. Uh, the offensive line has really been a disappointment the entire you know, three-year period that Dan Mullen's been in Gainesville, so that's got to get a lot better. There's a lot of talent at the running back position, so you – you got to be able to utilize those guys with some more success. It starts with the offensive line getting a little bit better push up front. I think they lack athleticism uh, up front. Uh, it, it's funny. You go look at Alabama. They're big, strong, physical guys, but they're incredibly athletic. They get out outside of some of the the, uh, the gap scheme runs and, mm -hmm. and what they do in, in, in terms of, of showing um, their ability to, to, to not just, you know, pass protect, but be able to, to really enforce their will on other – uh, team's defensive fronts. I, I think, you know, Florida's got to get better in that, that way. Um, but I do think it'll help whether it's Emory Jones or Anthony Richardson. I'm not saying I, I I'm, I'm probably one of the few that does not believe it's a foregone conclusion that Emory Jones shows up and rolls his helmet out there. And it's the starting quarterback. I mean, I think he's going to get pushed by Anthony Richardson, another highly recruited quarterback right here from Gainesville. Um, but both of those guys are very athletic, much more athletic than what Kyle Trask was. Um, so I think you'll you'll see some of the the number game being advantage uh, of advantage in the run game for Florida because of what the quarterback will be able to do running the football. Um, but I, I you know how much does Florida suffer from losing Kyle Trask in the past game? Kyle was incredibly um, accurate with with his throws. He knew where to go based upon what the defense was giving him. So my hope is that that Emory Jones has has waited his turn, has really gotten a great grasp of what this offense requires of him, that Dan Mullen's going to put him in position to be successful. And not, you don't lose much in the passing game, and you add a lot with an athletic quarterback that can be a much bigger threat in the run game. Mm. Uh, this could be a very difficult, much different, but very difficult offense to stop in its own right. And you, you look at what they lost with, with Kyle Pitts at the tight end spot, Trayvon Grimes, uh, Kadarius Toney. Those are big names and big shoes to fill, but there's a lot of talent both at the tight end position with Kamari Gamble and Keon Zipperer, and, and then you look at uh, Trent Whittemore at the wide receiver spot, Xavier Henderson, Jacob Copeland. There, there's a lot of guys that you may not heard a ton about yet that have played some significant downs that are going to be big-time players in, in Florida's offense this year. Yeah, no, it's going to be exciting to see. Uh, and real quick, too, I told you that was the last question. I lied to you, Chris. Sorry. Do you think Nick Saban's going to be the first coach 
uh, to ever have his mind put into a robot that they put on the sidelines and he'll coach Alabama until uh, a meteor hits the earth? You, you don't think they're trying to develop that right now? You don't think that the folks in Tuscaloosa, the 100%. scientists and doctors are working on that? I mean, you know, it, it, it was, again, everybody makes this, this big, you know, hubbub about the extension and, and him coaching into his late seventies. Like there's never going to be a day where Alabama doesn't extend his contract. If Nick Saban wants to That's continue exactly to, right. to coach. Right. So you yeah. just continue to add years on. I know whenever the final season comes for him at, at Alabama, there's going to be remaining years on his contract. Um, it, it gives the appearance obviously to recruits right now that, that he's going to be there for the entirety of their career. Um, but I do think this year may have reinvigorated Coach Saban. You know, having to miss the week of preparation for the Georgia game, having to miss the, the Iron Bowl, I think that you know, we all have a little bit better appreciation for what we consider to be normal once it got taken away from us. And I, I think that probably did extend his career uh, a couple years more in Tuscaloosa. Definitely. I uh, agree with you 100%. Chris, great stuff. Please tell everybody where they can find you on social media and where they can catch you on XM. Uh, with Hester, I was down there at uh, OTB, saw Jake down there and Nola, man, or went over to Baton Rouge and said, what's up? Uh, where can everybody nice. find you? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I, I do make my appearances mostly on on uh, during football season on the SEC Network, mm -hmm. but you can hear me and Peter Burns year-round on the uh, SEC channel on Sirius XM. That's 374. I actually took uh, this morning off so I could uh, hang out with you a little bit here. Not solely for that, but uh, that made it more convenient to get this uh, cut. But I do, you know, he and I talk baseball, softball. We're talking mm -hmm. basketball. We're talking, uh, obviously, football as we lead up to SEC Media Days. So uh, lots of things to, to talk about uh, in the SEC, and it, it gives me a chance to stretch my wings a little bit outside of just the football talk. Without a doubt, man, and I know you've been watching college baseball as well, uh, Guy, pretty daggum good baseball player in your own right. But, Chris, I really appreciate it. Thanks for taking time. Uh, you know, I knew I was cooler than PB, but I don't want him to get upset, you know, knowing you're coming here. No, I'm just kidding. We love Peter here. We have him all hey, the time. Hey, PB's – PB, you know, his nickname's Part-Time Pete. So, <laughs> Part-Time Pete, he, I think he's off the rest of the week and then on vacation next week. So, I, he, oh. he, he, believe me, he's he's, he's taking much more uh, of the uh, liberties with oh, the days okay. off of the offseason than I am. Yeah, how much golf is about to get played by that individual? No, qu no question. He just had a big trip, I think, uh, somewhere up in like Wisconsin or somewhere. <laughs> you, you check his social media, you know where he's playing golf. Uh, definitely. Some guys go to Wisconsin to hunt whitetails. Some guys go up there to hunt hole-in-ones, and that's Peter Burns. Chris that's Doring, right. I really appreciate it, buddy. Uh, it's always fun. Uh, we'll do this again soon as we march toward the season. Uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your day and uh, everything goes good. Yeah, if I don't see you beforehand, I'll, I'll see you in, in Hoover. For yeah, a that's right. For a little over a month. Oh, the first the first in person link up, man. That that could, that right. could be fun. Definitely, we'll uh, yeah. we'll go have a cold soda and, and tell some stories, man. But uh, that sounds good. <laughs> all right, buddy, I appreciate it. We appreciate y'all as well. Head over to jboyshow.com, grab some merchandise. Uh, got the black hoodie, the gray hoodie that sells like hotcakes. I mean, that's that's the best seller. We can't make three D print them fast enough. I guess you could say. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify as well. It's been another edition of the J Boy Show. I'm like Chris Doring running a vertical, catch it from Danny Werfel. He's going, going. Gone. The J-Boy Show is produced by David Cohn, Technical Director Dave Hammock, Creative Director David Culbertson, Audio Engineer Faison Sharif, Production Assistants Blaine Crane and Kyle Orr, Executive Producers Jake Crane, Vince Thompson, Steve Chamberlain, and David Cohn. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and visit our website, thejboyshow.com, for updates regarding our newest apparel and merch designs. When the water cooler with the J-Boy Show.